And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet. And I fucked it up my intro. <laughs> I was gonna say. Good fucking job. <laughs> great, jo uh... great job, you dumbass. <laughs> it is not the monastery, it is Geek Watch. But it is a subsidiary <laughs> of the monastery, the open bar of the internet. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra. And with me, I have three good brothers here in the temple. We have, surprisingly, early and straight this week. Or rather not, because he's technically three days late and gay. <laughs> good brother Doku. We have the, the, man, take, the man taking over all of your, all of your anime with a... Dr with a dr with a dragon shirt, so I no longer have to make Guy Fieri jokes. Good brother Shades, and we have the bane of my existence, the man of a thousand runes, and the CEO of Z of Zadari Enterprises, who will in who will undoubtedly be in a three way war between Guy Amatsu and Dan Kuroto in the near future. Good brother Xanatrix. They need to step up up to my level. <laughs> Even goddamn Kuroto needs to step up to my level. Oh, gee. That's some bold words there. <laughs> uh, also, M Mildra, you know I've got to play this for for that botch. Yeah, I know. <laughs> You'd think I'd get used to that right. growing up with peanuts my whole life. What do you what do you have a uh, against the the uh, the Duke of Flavortown? Guy Fieri is a is a modern marvel. Oh, I got I got nothing against him. In fact, in fact, I had bought I had bought the module Monsters of Murica, which I I just need to show you guys the cup. I just need to show you guys the cover. <laughs> and I showed I showed Lady K this cover a while back, and she and I remember she having a bit of a reaction to it. especially especially some of the comments on drive through RPG but this was a this was a satirical campaign campaign setting called monsters in Morica restaurants and retail and let me let me make sure that this okay here we go this should work. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> oh uh, that's that's the, drag, the dragon of Flavor Town. <laughs> Indeed, it doesn't exactly hurt, it doesn't exactly help that there, that it has a wizard it has a wizard subclass called School of Gur of Gormomancy. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> so you can literally be the the wizard of Flavor Town. That's I'm not gonna lie, I love it. <laughs> meme magic is real, I'm telling you. But we are not here for meme magic. We are not here for Mur for Murica, because we have an international audience here. But we are he we are here for to de to deal with a fa a fall a fallen a fallen son of Edmonton. We ha because after all after all the poking that we've done at Bioware's expense over the last three years, give or take, I figure it would, I figured a good a good segment for Geek Watch would be the exploration of the Mass Effect trilogy, and specifically the trends that it popularized and why those trends would be very short-lived, which, which is why this episode is titled Mass Effect and the Curse of Choice. And, and curse might be a bit harsh. It would be far more accurate to say that its, a, that its approach was, a ma was the, magis, was the um, magic monkey's paw. Um, in fact, originally I was going to title this, but I was originally going to just do a general Bioware thing called Bioware, the studio that sold its soul. But 
I will admit that that was a little bit too close to the Houston video that um, Urinating Tree did. So I nixed that. But there... Now, there are a, co there are a couple of things that I specifically want, wanted to focus on. Um, one of them, which we'll... And we'll be getting into these eventually. One of them was the Your Choices Matter narrative. And the other is the... But is the um, binary morality theming when it comes to mor when it comes to moral choices? But we need to set the stage first. So uh, up until the in the time the time period between Jade Empire and Mass Effect, when it was originally just called Science Fiction X, which um, the document that the document itself is a bit of a, is a bit of a laugh. <laughs> Inclu including things like a living economy and a and a brand new engine fine tuned for the Xbox Two. Look, that's what it said. That's what it said in the document. Nobody knew at the time it was going to be called the Xbox Three Hundred and Sixty. And at the time, it was called SFX or Science Fiction X. And the it's very it's very clear when you look at the way BioWare was developing things up until that point that they wanted to make an action game. You we kind of we kind of saw this with J, with Jade Empire, although Jade Empire isn't actually full action as peop, as people thought it was. It's still you it's still using the action cue that was used in Knights of the Old Republic. It's just hidden. The only reason I know about it is because that was re that particular thing was revealed thanks to the thanks to the um, focus modification in Jade Empire and Style, which is actually a really good mod for the for the original Jade Empire. But the big the big problem is that what that what they wanted to do just wasn't compatible with the hardware that they had, which has led several um, Bioware staffers to refer to the development of the first Mass Effect as the land of compromises. And the funny thing with all three of them is that if it weren't for the writing, I think Mass Effect would be slagged a lot harder than it than it has been. The universe is 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 where the bulk of the work went, specifically with a trinity of combat, exploration, and dialogue. Now the the I now I now the the other big first of course was that this was this being their first um first attempt at a voiced protagonist because we did we didn't have and since we since their other major project Dragon Age took so long to develop it didn't have that um this ultimately meant that that we had to ask which voice do I want to hear for the next month and. I will. I will. I'm not too proud to admit it. I I went with Femshep the majority of the time. <laughs> I know. I know that. Z I know that Zan didn't. I uh, I went insane with these games. Um, I played a combination of every class and both sexes evenly. Um, across all three games. Yes, that's six playthroughs of the game, alternating between. Male and Femshep. And and also testing out every romance possible. I won't be discussing the romances too much, largely because there's not a whole lot to discuss, because the format the format for the for the romance conversations ends up go ends up going along a certain pattern. Um Do you like them? Or do you just want to be friends? That's usually how it ended up. And I will. I will. Ad I will admit that in my in my case, um, at least at least with the first playthrough, the ro the romance in question was Garrus. Um. In part, be in part because I like <coughs> I like him. <laughs> he's pro he's de he's definitely he can definitely be on the on the um on the hard on the hard edge end of end of things, but. For a good reason, unlike some other hard edge people. Looking at you, Javik. Yeah, I didn't like Javik. Um, but obvious, obviously, it ha obviously, 
Mass Effect 8, which was originally a Xbox 360 exclusive, then later going on to the PC with some with some improvements. And that then they may, then of course Bioware makes their de- makes their titular deal with the devil by get, by taking the EA money, which at least for Mass Effect 2 did result in a massive upgrade when it came to the pre- when it came to the presentation and cinematography of how they did things. But the but the but it came at the cost of the RPG aspect. And they tried to they tried to see if they could play a middle ground between the between the action part and the RPG part with Mass Effect 3 with nah, with um mixed results. I'd say the the big the big problem is You have no idea how th- you have no idea how thankful I am that the um co- that the cover based appro- the cover based um regenerating health shooter thing has started to fall by the wayside considering how inescapable that was a decade ago. Yeah. I mean, we talk and I I want to ma- I do want to make clear unlike say um Yahtzee I don't hate the co- the idea of regenerating health or a cover based system. I don't like how it w- how it was misimplemented by so many. The reason why Halo and Call of Duty can get away with it is because of their sense of intensity. You're not re- and in though in those games you're all you're always making some kind of push. In something like Gears, it's the emph- where it re- where it really got popularized. It was to emphasize the um, the brutality of, of the game to, because of the fact that you have a lot of slow firing, high damage weapons, and you're not and you're not exactly nimble, so mistakes are going to be punished a lot harder than in other games. But with something with something like Mass Effect, there wasn't really the level of impact that would justif- that would justify it. Plus, there was the whole thing with the with the with with the um. Oh, you're you're not you're not using ammo. You're ejecting heat clips. Yeah, uh, heat sinks. But why? Uh, why is it only one heat sink per shot? Because every shot is an overcharged blast without getting the extra damage. Because fuck you. That's why. To implement an ammo wonder, system. Why didn't you play those games? I saw the right. I, I had a feeling. My gut was telling me that was a disaster waiting to happen. Um, I would. I would be remiss if I did if I didn't point out that I remember people. I remember people boasting about how about how there's about there being six classes, so there's so you can have multiple playthroughs. Except the class the class setup is j- is really more of three and three. A pure three, and then and then th- and then three gishes. Which there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, Dragon's Dogma has that as that exact same setup. But um, I'd ar- I'd actually argue that that oh, that um the hybrids are don't have don't bring enough to the table to justify that to justify them to justify picking them over one of the pures. Um. Vanguard has the biotic charge and, sh- and uh, the ability to knock anybody off of ledges and insta-kill them. Uh, Engineer has the phase shielding, which you can literally then hold y-, uh, y on an Xbox 360 controller to purge and cause a huge explosion, and then put it back on again if you buy the right perks. Uh, and the, uh, the infiltrator... Well, if you use the cloak and get a headshot, it doesn't matter how much armor or shields they have. They're dead. Actually, now I take it back. It's the other way around. The hybrids end up being the op- being the OP end of things and the pure the pure I'd say the only the only one of the th- the only one of the three pure classes that seems to be able to hold its own fairly well at least in my adept. experience was um yeah, was adept. So th- as someone who played all six classes extensively, I can tell you that the weakest class is the pure tech class. Um, I don't know why they made it so so uh, weak, but even the soldier 
the pure the pure uh, gunner class had more utility with the ability to well use any one of the four weapon types and also have tons of ammo types to choose from out the ass for any situation mm-hmm but Adept class is the class that I used for all my insanity runs. Because warp explosions. Warp detonation is the most broken mechanic that they came up with in 2 and 3. And what now when it comes when it comes to there there is one there is one little annoying thing that ha- that happened in um in 2 regarding how they hit, how they did fights. And that is pl- and that is placing enemies, and especially enemies with rockets, out of bounds. Which, if you're playing, so- if you're playing something like Soldier, wh- where you have access to long-range weaponry, that's not t- that's that's not too much of a problem. If you're playing a class whose be- whose best ranged weaponry is an SMG, that's a problem. Well, see, that's the thing. The reason that the adept was good for insanity runs is you put on the lowest amount of guns, in, especially in 3, where the amount of equipment you had di- dictated your, your, uh, power, um, re- your power cooldowns. Mm-hmm. Um, and you don't use a gun. You focus on getting your power cooldowns as small as possible, and you spam the shit out of biotics. Because warp detonations kill everything good. Mm-hmm. Um, even with that, even with that, um, the the other the the big problem that we really started to see with t- with two is the fact that when you're go- when you're going when you consider a when you consider just the starting mission in one compared to two, or even just even just some of the standalone mis- some of the standalone missions, you have multiple. There is multiple ways you can tackle things. And so, and sometimes get more reward than you, than was initially planned. With two, a lot of a lot of those optional routes were ta- were taken out, and you were just given the mission. I'd say two was the was the real was was where we really started to see the first seeds of that. You're along for the ride attitude that they that we would later see with more infamous stuff like Dragon Age Two and every and everything after that. Like you're being given the privilege of playing of playing audience to the story Bioware wants to tell. Yep. Oh. The entire reason that some of them started calling us entitled. Damn right, I'm entitled. I paid the fucking money. Yeah. Well, well, trust me. We'll get it. We'll get to that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but that bring that brings us to the whole curse of choice now. From from the start, there the there has been a kind of tr- there's been a kind of trinity when it comes to the options that you had in conversation. Your responses be- being a trinity of either neutral, well-meaning, stern, or in some cases paragon and renegade, and then with two adding the interrupts, which originally were going to be in one, but wor- but weren't available to be in there. Um, Remember that the in- that the best interrupt ever is when you headbutt a fucking krogan. <laughs> and, somehow, and the other Krogan goes, "You do get our ways," and you're like, "You bet your ass, I do." Headbutt. Yeah. Um. Either, either that or either that or having a Krogan with a stick up his a stick up his ass, going, "You dare." The other one is punching what's her name in the face because she's a dumb bitch who always tries to spin things into really bad stories that make Shepard look bad. Oh, so a jur- oh, so a, na- oh, a natural games journalist. Yeah, before 2014. Yeah, I'm I'm surprised. Mm-hmm. Not really. Um. Sp- speaking of that, it's de- it, it was definitely a um cu- it was definitely a curious conflict of interest to have a IGN personality as a guest char- as a guest character in Mass Effect Three. <laughs> uh, we we don't talk about that. Yeah, okay, you got to admit, it's pretty, it's pretty amusing and ironic when you actually take Polygon or Kotaku and use that as a template for a character. Um, but in, but when it comes to when it comes to the whole when it comes to the conversation thing, there's 
it's um it's very interesting to com to compare this to the way up to the to the way other games have handled conversation cuz one one flaw with with con with dialogue trees in RPGs that I think I think we've all acknowledged but have just seen it as a conse a consequence of the game is the interrogation issue where you're just go you're just going through all of the available options might miss some backstory mm -hmm. got to got to get got to get involved in all the options um <laughs> I'd actually say that this is that this kind of thing is an even bigger consequence of the point and click adventure style approach. I think that this is just a consequence of hiding lore in the game's dialogue trees and 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 actual logs that you can find in the environment that's been around in uh, RPGs for a long time. Mm -hmm. Um, but the but the other the other issue is is one that's very specific to this particular brand of dialogue wheel and the, and um that is what lore runner has called the tor effect where the uh, where the option that you see and what you end up actually saying don't exactly match up oh yeah so I mass effect you a small Gotta get my word in here somewhere. <laughs> yeah. But it's like when you when you, you get like a couple of words that give you the impression of one thing, you're like, oh, that's what I would have done. That sounds like someone I would normally like, click it, and the actual thing you say is like, whoa, 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 wait, wait, no, that's not what I meant. Now, the defense that I, the defense that I've heard for this from from the developers and from and from other analysts is that how you phrase things in your head and how you and how it how you actually say it don't always match up which is technically true but i don't but i don't quite agree with that being an excuse for the, for this particular approach Specif specifically because if you're taking that approach then what you're effectively telling me is that con is that conversations ev even when there isn't one should be treated like a dice roll now if you're dealing with something where you have a conversational skill like say fallout Okay, that's understandable, but that's not the case here. And in fact, they, in fact, they were, tr in fact, with considering how Mass Effect was trying to dial back on dice rolls, when it comes to this sort of thing, that that's ult that's ultimately a failing. I know this is a brief side note, but I have to point it out just to get it off my chest. I absolutely hate when the fucking dialogue choices don't match up to what the character says when you choose it. Mm -hmm. It drives me nuts. That's kind of the point we've been making, Doku. Because yeah. yeah, it's it's stupid. Hell, you know, we mentioned Fallout. Um, anyone remember Fallout 4's dialogue system? Yeah. yeah. Wait, what are we talking about? A game that doesn't exist? I'm sorry. <laughs> F Fallout Fallout ended at New Vegas, bro. What are you talking about? <laughs> Wait, I know it's what you guys are talking about. I just had to say it because it's, I've just been imagining examples in my head that I can remember from the past. I'm just like, uh... I, I would like yeah, to point it, out that earlier Mass, that er, early on in Mass Effect, that issue wasn't as prominent. Mass Effect One, what what was seen on the dialogue wheel and what was said, fit hand in hand most of the time. I'd say, I'd say the only. It's, the only time I can think of with with Mass Effect where the where the dialogue options really became a problem was um was the was the conversation with Saren. <sighs> you mean where none of none of the ma choices mattered unless you had maxed out intimidation or or uh <laughs> or coercion um charm just charm that one. And to be to be quite to be quite honest, I I think that I think that having intimidation and charm as skill trees was a mistake. Largely because most of, most of the people who are going who are going to be applying their talent points are going to be putting them into things that are going to aid their survivability in battle, even if that aid is an illusion. So because mm -hmm. of that, it's unreasonable for the, it's unreasonable to assume that even at that point even if they grinded the shit out of game out of the game that they w that they would have mac that they would have either the conversation skills maxed out 
There, mm, again, as somebody who who played through the games extensively, there's actually there's an optimal path you can take from brand new. You don't need like new game plus or anything from brand new. That will get you all of the points you need in Intimidate or Charm, depending on how you'd like to go. And a bunch of points for all your skills to make sure that you stay alive. Um, <laughs> but it, it also requires that you an- do very specific missions at specific times, answer specific questions in very specific ways to get the freebie upgrades to, to skills that you otherwise wouldn't get answering in, in different fashions. And, and that brings up the problem of, like, yeah, you, you, the optimal way to play is so micromanaged. I'd call that the Persona 3 problem. Where you have to know in advance exactly how to play the game to get the optimal route. I've, ar- I've, already, it, it, I've already coined this kind of thing a, a long time ago, Shades. It's hand-breaking. Well, still... I'm just ma- I, I use Persona 3 as a reference point because that's another game where unless you know exactly what to do, you could find yourself in some serious screwed situations. Permanent game over. Gotta start over now because you didn't get the right Personas. But uh... when, but the the I'd say but even even with those problems. There is, there is at least some degree of some degree of consistency with the idea that your that your conversations are from the perspective of a career soldier. Um. Much in the, much in the same. W- but uh, but th- but then there's the other problem, and that is the whole binary morality thing, the paragon and re- the whole paragon and renegade, which. This is the third. This would be the third time this had been tried. The first, of course, was the whole light side, dark side in um, Knights of the Old Republic, which was understandable. You're still you're still playing a Jedi in one in one form or another, so that was going to happen. Um, Plus, in Knights of the Old Republic, having choosing one of those different routes did have an impact on your gameplay. You know, if you went down a particular route, you would unlock specific skills akin to that route. If you chose the light side, you would have more boosting and supportive and healing type things. Whereas if you went dark side, you would end up getting stuff like, you know, more, more effects, uh, like, you know, force lightning, force choke and things like that. Mm-hmm. There was a tangible effect for the choices you made. Yeah. And there is a way you could still game the system to get both sides of powers. <laughs> because why not? I'll be a gray. <laughs> to be fair, to my opinion, I think that's the way you should be going. Yeah. But when it and then we then we had the open palm, closed fist approach with Jade Empire, which I've always said that I like I like the from a narrative perspective I like what it's trying to do from a mechanical perspective I don't because it locks I, out certain things permanently There's there's that but there's all but there's there's also but there's one other issue and I'll and I need to set the stage first The idea is that open palm and closed fist are two different philosophies Open palm is is supposed to be all ab- all about um har- all about harmony. Um, whereas cl- whereas closed fist, it's supposed to be about di- about discord, about a very um a very Darwinistic attitude of only of only the strong should survive. Conquest versus conquest versus harmony. Yeah, <laughs> That's the way I always saw it. The problem it the problem is in execution. It may as well be light side, dark side from Star from Star Wars, all over again. And given given how given how a lot a lot of um a lot of wuxia analogies can be made with Star Wars, I can <laughs> I can um I can see the I can see the intent, but I'm not sure if that's the right intent to actually go about it with th- with this approach. Especially especially since and this and this is the this is the bigger problem. It's very cl- with harm with um open palm and closed fist. It's very clear 
which is supposed to be the good side and which is supposed to be the bad side. Um, and with with and this kind this kind of mentality, very much carried over to Paragon and Renegade. The idea the idea in, the, in with Paragon and Renegade is compassion and ruthlessness, um, at least on paper. In practice, it, tr it there are certain a there are certain actions that any um pro any pro human actions are tr are treated as rent are treated as renegade a lot of the times, even if it doesn't make any logical sense. It's because uh, it's because it's ex it's expedience versus um, expedience ver versus community. It's not even. Ruthlessness versus compassion. It's expedience, which focusing on just humanity, the people that you know the most about, mm -hmm. would be an expedient process. Versus community, getting the entire galaxy together. <laughs> which, honestly, was a bad limitation as well. Yeah, the, bi the big problem is that Whenever, whenever, you try and do, whenever you try and do a sort of, a sort of morality system in this approach... You end up having situations where, cer where certain actions are labeled as good or bad, with no with no room for discussion. And in some cases, you have you have instances where they where a bad option is put in just to give a, just to give a false choice. Um, this is this is ultimately why I, this is ultimately why the whole choose what choose whether or not to to extract Adam from. The Little Sisters in Bioshock isn't is does is a choice that doesn't have as much gravity as they as um, look as um, as Looking Glass seems to seems to have thought it did. Yeah, that that game like literally, and, and you know it's funny. Like one of our buddies when he reviewed the game made a very good point about this. In that game, yeah, obviously the, the game almost kind of uh, doesn't even really punish you or reward you for choosing either side because. Yeah, sure, you'll get more Adam if you to uh, extract from the little sisters, but if you save them, eventually you're just going to get rewarded with a gift box from them, which also includes a whole shit ton of Adam. Whoops. Um, <laughs> a, a, a shit ton of Adam and a and a and a, a free plasmid. Uh however, oh. <laughs> the the calculations have been done. Um you do get less Adam overall just uh saving all the sisters, but that doesn't matter because if you're focusing on only the good plasmids and other upgrades, uh, it's enough atom to max all of them out. Yeah, a, it was such a, it was such a joke in my opinion, and I get the feeling the developers do it too because they turned right around and say what, whether you like love it or hate it. I think they 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 took a pot shot at their own morality system when it came to Bioshock Infinite <laughs> or their own choice system. That's cer that's certainly a possibility, although um. Although the, although that's that's one of those that's one of those cases where it's a, where the big pro, the big problem that the big problem that I had with how they did it was the, was the fact that as I as I mentioned to you last night the sto the um the story is so divorced from the setting whereas if you look at if you look at the first Bioshock its story is intrinsically linked to its setting. You cannot tell. You cannot tell that story without rapture. While no, I agree. <laughs> the while well, the story I, I agree of with that. the story of Booker, you don't really need Columbia to tell that story. Nope, they just wanted some place fantastical to tell it, and they'd already done Under the Sea twice, so they wanted to do In the Sky instead. I've got nothing <sighs> against the idea of go of going up into this of going up into the sky, and the idea of a of exp of exposing the flaws of that of that 1920s American exceptionalism, and actually 1910s, I should say, is so is something I'm perfectly fine with exploring. But they didn't. Yeah, it, there. Like I said, love it or hate it, there are issues with it. I'm not gonna sit here and say I'm, I'm not gonna defend the game in any particular. I'm just saying that one key aspect was something that I thought was interesting, where they they basically. They gave they they showed they they pointed out the illusion of choice. Yeah, and it was 
and considering when this came when it came out, it was clear they weren't they were just taking pot shots at all the choice based systems like Mass Effect, like Infamous, like its own game, mm-hmm. showing that it doesn't really matter what you choose, things will ne- not, not everything will uh, change as a result. But that does tie into something that you can't you kind of hinted at when you were talking about light side, dark side, and that is. A lot of the good uses of the of this binary morality or binary allegiance thing give some give some kind of gameplay reward to players. And I'll use Infamous as as an example with this. For the first Infamous, if you chose if you chose to if you chose the heroic route, then you would then a lot of the electricity powers that you would get would rely more on precision. And more, more on more on directed damage. Whereas, if you cho- if you chose if you chose the darker route, you'd get a lot of AOE stuff and a lot of everything is going to get blown up kind kind of style with your um, with your method of upgrading your method of progress. And yep, this ca- this carried over into in, into Infamous Two, where in where um. Your neutral powers were your were your lightning, and your good and your good and evil ones were your were your um ice and fire powers. Yeah, and go back to the first game real quick. That it, it not only the the fact that the powers were determined based on your morality actually made sense as well, because yeah, directed attacks because you being a good person, you only want to focus on those people you don't you want to stop. Whereas if you go the dark the dark route. Well, yeah, you just don't really give a shit. Anything, everything burns, mm-hmm. you know. So it makes sense that that would be the case with the power sets, and Infamous Two does kind of carry that. An Infamous Second Son, the choices don't really matter. No, not not ri- not really. I I like. Don't get me wrong. I I like sec I like Second Son, and I like the power variety that it that it that it presented. Um. I did not like the fact that once you got the concrete power after uh, defeating the final boss, you had to defeat other enemies to restore it. Couldn't we have gone to, like, the street and just taken concrete from the street? Come on now. Yeah, that that was that was re- that was really damn dumb. Um, and I still I never I never finished first light, so I can't comment on that. But. When it, but when it comes to when it comes to Mass Effect, even th- throughout the entire trilogy, being more pen- Paragon or or Renegade doesn't re- doesn't really af- doesn't really affect your gameplay as much. And I could see some people saying that that's good because nothing's nothing's locked off. But it also means that aside aside from the story, there's not an, there's not really enough incentive to go, to do a full Paragon or full Renegade. Run after you've after you've done one playthrough. The incentive to do multiple playthroughs is alt is alternate choices at junction points more than anything else, or playing a different class just to see how it plays. Yeah, yeah. Now the only the only time Paragon and Renegade change things dramatically, and this assumes that you also have the extended cut DLC for Mass Effect 3, which was eventually made free, so everybody eventually had it, um, was with the endings of Mass Effect 3. And yes, yes, we know. Choose your own color of Kool-Aid. We know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <The> <laughs> but joke, it, we, 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 the, every joke of it has been made. We don't need to add to it. it. But here's the thing about the endings of Mass Effect 3. Both prior to extended cut... And after extended cut, it doesn't matter which one you choose. There's only one correct answer. Now, this is why I say that Mass Effect doesn't have a binary, a, a binary morality system, um, but a binary attitude system. Uh, unlike previous Bioware main characters, even with Revan. Those characters are more blank slate. Revan is a perfect example, literal blank slate. He'd been brain he'd been brainwashed into amnesia. Uh the the uh 
the characters of Jade Empire, your your kung fu person number three hundred twenty two now going on your hero's hero's wuxia journey. That's 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 really it. With Mass Effect, the consequences of of having someone who is voiced wasn't as heavy as the consequences of having someone who has an established background. Because, by necessity, Shepard had to be some sort of career military person. And yes, you could influence a little bit what their, what their upbringing was like and what, what they were known for in the military, uh, whether it was being a sole survivor or a war hero, uh, whether they came from a colony or they were a spacer, things of that nature. Shepard is not a blank slate. Shepard can't be a blank slate. And because of that, Shepard's morality is chosen from the get-go. Shepard's goals, as soon as he sees what happens uh, at the very beginning of Mass Effect 1, sees the <clears throat> sees what Saren is doing with the Geth in, in conjunction with all of the uh, mysterious goings on in that weird dreadnought ship of his you know because we, we didn't know it was they were called the reapers yet it's it, it's set in stone at that point that shepherd's morality is stop the reapers and so paragon and renegade are just what is my attitude when trying to stop the reapers and this gets fleshed out as the series goes on eventually it's not just stop the Reapers, it's stop the Reapers because every life form in the universe has a right to exist and choose its path of existence. And this is why eventually when you get to Mass Effect 3 and its ending, there's only one correct answer. That correct answer is Paragon Control. And here's the reasons why. Renegade Control turns... Shepard into Reaper Shepard, uh, Tyrant Overlord. Clearly not what Shepard was going for. You didn't stop the Reapers, you became the thing you hated and took over the universe. Synthesis, no matter which side you choose, forces a choice on every, uh, forces an outcome with a no choice on every sentient being, and even some non-sentient beings like plants, plants, excuse me, uh, <laughs> into becoming a synthesis between fully organic and fully synthetic and is now halfway between the two. And destroy kills an entire two races of people. The Geth and the Reapers. Mm -hmm. Paragon control makes the choice a choice that affects only Shepard, which is exactly how Shepard morally would play. They would never want to force a choice on the rest of the galaxy. They were always fighting to convince the galaxy to fight for itself. In Paragon Control, Shepard becomes the Reaper Fleet, helps rebuild the mass relays, uh, disseminates the knowledge of the previous cycles to the current cycle of the galaxy, and stands guard over the galaxy, but does not once force anything on the galaxy. And every time I've made this argument, there have been multiple people coming from the woodwork going, but control is the evil choice. The elusive man wanted control. I'm like, yes. And you notice that he was always in blue and that the control ending is in blue. The canonical paragon good guy color for the series They're like oh that's just that's just a uh, uh, evidence of the indoctrination theory i'm like indoctrination theory is stupid shut the fuck up <sighs> without extended cut you don't get the additions of you know help, stays around helps rebuild the mass relays uh disseminates knowledge but you do get Shepard does not force a choice on the rest of the galaxy. With Extended Cut, you then get the additional context that shows that there's only one right choice, and it is that one. Because refusal 
is Bioware being a bunch of salty bitches going, oh, you refused? Well, then everybody dies anyway. Fuck you. Because they, be, it's some. Um, I had, I had, ha- I had had a theory at one point that 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 there was a bit of scrambling going about when that in, when that initial script got leaked about six months before release, and so, and some of the multiplayer um, stuff that they were testing that they ultimately dropped that also got leaked. I remember seeing that footage, and the. Th- the theory that I had is that is much li- much like how much like how certain re- certain wrestling f- people will ch- will change the ending if they f- if they feel that the audience has ma- has has managed to figure it out or certain comic book people. Um, anybody remember the whole the whole um mo- the whole thing with Monarch? Mm. Not Venture Brothers Monarch, but the but the DC villain where. Everybody had figured it out. Everybody, all signs had pointed out that it was that Monarch was Captain Adam. But when people figured it out, DC went, "Oh shit! There goes our, there goes the reveal." Oh, I know. Let's make it into Hawk, even though that makes no goddamn sense whatsoever. Yep. See that 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 to me is the one thing that I think a lot of creators don't understand. Yes. If you are telling your story right, there is a good chance a lot of people will figure out some of your bigger twists. But a lot of them will often forgive you for making it a little obvious if you tell it right. For us, it's not always just about being a surprise. It's about being, being making sense. I've had times where the, the, the big twist of this person's going to be the villain became so fucking obvious that it's like, well, come on, you're, not, you're practically telegraphing it now. But I let it go, and I didn't get mad about it because it's like, oh, well, now that I see their motivations and why they would do something like this, I'm okay with this. Mm-hmm. It's not that hard to figure out. Don't worry about being a surprise. Just worry about telling a good fucking story. How many times do I have to repeat myself with that particular mantra? <laughs> Apparently not enough. <laughs> Apparently I will be repeating that mantra until the day I fucking die. But, I think we all will at that point, Shades. When, um, I think when I think when it when it comes to the idea of do, of doing those of doing those sorts of twists, um, you ult- when you do it wrong, you ultimately become M Night Shyamalan, where huh. you, where you're bu- where you're ga- <laughs> you're um putting you're putting far too much faith in in a in a surprise that that um. That you don't that you don't have any, you don't have anything else to go upon. Essentially, you're pu- you're pulling the one thing you're doing the one thing that anybody who knows anything about gambling knows you don't do unless you want to get fucked. Bet go all in. <laughs> like put yeah. put it all put it all on black. You don't do you don't do that. Whether you don't put it all on red, you don't put it all on black, because at, because if you do that, everybody at the table knows you're getting desperate or you're. Ex- or you are overly confident, and they're going to take advantage of you. Now, one time out of a million, somebody gets lucky, and they end up having a royal flush when they went all in. But that, but that is, but that is luck of the gods kind of situation. And usually, someone's going to assume someone's cheating, and then, and then out come the gun, guns, and then we have the good old Mexican standoff. You know, <laughs> you know, logical progression. We've been watching too many westerns lately, Monk. <laughs> Bitch, please! I grew I grew up watching Gunsmoke as a little kid. Like I said, too many westerns lately. Um, Gunsmoke anyway. existed when you were a kid. Are you sure it wasn't made when you were in your twenties? <laughs> Old man, fuck off! <laughs> but one of these days he's gonna get killed. I swear. <laughs> no, because you can only. That'd do be that too once. easy. No, the problem is you can only. I can only do that once. Like I said, it'd be too easy. It wouldn't be enough. Not enough punishment. <laughs> but I know where your mindset is. Yeah. But when it comes, um, there's been pl- there's been plenty of t- now the the good example of of a of a of a proper and natural twist within um within Mass Effect was the whole th- was the reveal of the Reapers 
it's a very it's a very Lovecraftian th thing that this hu that this huge dreadnought is actually is actually the vanguard of a race of aliens. Um, I wasn't surprised when I found out that the inspiration for the Reaper's design is the Reaper cuttlefish that exists in deep sea. Because if you want if you want a if you want um, a good source of inspiration for 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 really weird and out there and out there monster designs. Just go look at deep sea wild. Just go look at deep sea wildlife. You'll find plenty to draw inspiration from. Lovecraft. Lovecraft wishes he could. He could have come up with half the shit he could find in real in real life. Mm -hmm. But, but that does the the um, big. I know there's a there's one sentiment that ha that happens with Mass Effect Three that I th that I think should be addressed, and that is the line: "It was perfect until the until the last fifteen minutes." Um, I am I'm of the I'm of the opinion that for for one, I don't think that's actually the case, especially given some of the issues I had with firefights. Um, least of which being they got as as Racevic and others have pointed out, they got rid of power weapons. But they decide they instead decide to have them as just power ups in um uh, in certain arenas. Which I find to be a very dumb move. Yeah. Because ultimate because um in, instead of instead of having people tr try and try and utilize their tool set to over to overcome some sort of major boss like get like Geth Pri like Geth Primes or or um or any or reaper banshees. No, instead, instead you're handing them this he this heavy ordnance that's far more powerful than your normal equipment. It is it is ulti it is ultimately the um the in it, the non-interactive turret sequences that people complain about in Call of Duty, um just with just with a coat of paint on it. And yes, the, yes, I know about the turret sequences in Mass Effect Three, which. <laughs> You don't even need to. Sh you don't even need to do any shooting in them. <laughs> Interactivity in my RPG, it's less likely than you think. <laughs> Actually, if you don't mind me going on a bit of a side change, because we've been talking about like the choices and endings. Yeah. There's another type of bad choices setup that involves endings, and oddly enough, we talked about Star Wars earlier. Star Wars is guilty of this particular trope. The no choice matters, but the final one. And the example I bring up is Star Wars Jedi Knight Jedi Academy. Because throughout the game, you can make choices. You can do stuff that puts you either on the light side or dark side pass. However, none of that matters. And except for the very final choice at the end, when you can choose to either spare or kill the rival character to determine which ending you get. And that's kind of Mass Effect the Mass Effect 3's endings kind of fall into that kind of line too. There where is, it doesn't matter what else what route you take. It's that final choice that's all that matters. There is one th there is one thing that a lot of people who are discussing the ending didn't didn't really um didn't really take into account, in my opinion, even when they br even when they brought up stuff stuff like the indoctrination theory, which sound which sounded which sounded interesting at first, but the more but the more that you think about it, the more it the more it doesn't warrant. I think I think it was people just trying to justify the fact that they saw a shitty ending. Um. Yes, the indoctrination theory was a, a classic case of coping. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but. Cons but consider this: the the op the opening of the op the opening of all, of all three of all three games. The first act, the first mission, is there to establish a tone. This is true. This is true for a lot of fiction. It's the reason. It's the reason why. Um, I'd, I'm. Pr I think. I think in one of his episodes, I think TJ Omega outright said that's the reason why he focused when he was doing TJ TV. That was why he focused just on the first episode. Because um, the first act establishes uh, the narr the narrative um, tone. Yeah, this goes all the way back to opera, the overture. Mm-hmm. And the the 
the first act, the first act with Mass Effect One is is estab is establishing the universe that you're inhabiting, and the, and the eventual threats that you may see. <coughs> yep. Mass Effect Two is is establishing the dar the darkening of that universe and the fact that you have the fact that you're going to have to make friends with pe with former enemies. That you're gonna have to deal with the underbelly. Yes. Mass Effect 3's op opening tone is is the is war is is war is hell and that apocalypse that you've been trying that you've been trying to stave off and to present now it's now it's coming and it's come to Earth. And the thing is, as when it comes to th when it comes to the first two, they're largely consistent within that. Three has a bit of a jumping around issue throughout. At first, you ha at first you have the whole, the whole war is hell thing, where a lot of it is focused. Then it shifts into the into this dichotomy about synthetics versus organics, specifically specifically in the context of the um get the geth and the geth and the canar <laughs> why does it canary um corians corians the problem it's the You're problem thinking dragon age um the problem is that the problem is that you have two you have two names both both with the same syllable and both considered social outcasts yeah but between the but between those two between those two you ha you have that you have that context of is is the conflict between synthetics and organics inevitable? And it's, and the Geth said no. The Geth said no. Legion be, Legion became Legion became Geth Jesus. And the and you would think and you would think that that whole thing is resolved. Even if the even if um I will continue to roast Bioware for the for the whole to Tali's face is a st is a modified stock foot stock Im image, <laughs> which was embarrassing. Don't get me started on how angry that made me. I recognized that stock image as soon as I finished that romance. She was my first romance path throughout the games, and when I got her face reveal on literally the same day I got the game, because I didn't stop playing for over 24 hours, <clears throat> um, I was just like, what? Wait a minute. And I had to go, and I did reverse image search, because even back then it worked. And I was like, why? There was plenty of fan art out there you could have commissioned someone to make that would have cost you less than than the amount of goodwill you just lost why well when when it comes if when it comes to this whole, as a countered when it comes to this whole this whole fan art going canon um that's what happened with dusk <laughs> um fan art fan art of dusk dude became um was originally just fan, was originally just fan art of the character, and th and then New Blood decided, yeah, this art, yeah, this art is now canon. And how much goodwill did that get them? A fuck ton. There's a re there's a reason why I keep highlighting new highlighting New Blood and the and the fact that um, Dave Oshry is a meme lord to the point where the one of the early um, websites that he that he had gotten the, that he had gotten the license for was Waste Dot Money. Ah. Um, but when it but legitimately, all they had to do was pay someone on fucking DeviantArt like two hundred dollars, and they would have gotten a really good piece of art for Tali. Hell, they they're already reaching out to the fan base when it came to the when it came to the cover art about whether or not they would use ma whether or not they would use um, male Shep or fem Shep, and the whole hair and eye color thing. So yep. And I I distinctly remember that there was a there was a fan art contest on DeviantArt related to Mass Effect. So why the fuck not? By the way, when it comes to Fem Shep, red hair, green eyes, fuck you, fight me. <laughs> hey, I'm not I'm not I'm not uh, arguing it. Oh, how would I how would I make the time to how would I make the time to not argue? Trick question. It's Jennifer Hale. I don't make I you make the time. <laughs> <laughs> but 
with but with that said, we would think that that whole synthetic versus organic thing is resolved, and then we and then we get the ending, where that ends up becoming the th that then we get the ending where it goes where it goes right back to the whole Shepard's not going to be able to save everyone, then going again to the synthetics versus organics debate, something that we thought we had already resolved. Because the catalyst is retarded. Never, never mind the fa never mind the fact that they that they reveal that the elusive man has taken over the catalyst. The catalyst is the citadel, which is re is repeating another thing where the citadel was already was already a big MacGuffin for the Reapers, and it's been moved to Earth for some reason. All of this off screen, by the way. In the in the in the span of fifteen seconds of dialogue, I I, re I really wish we had gotten Drew Carpishan's ending instead. Carp, from what from what I understand, he had you going inside Harbinger and having a philosophical debate the entire way. Yeah, this also this also brings up something I did want to ask you about, Zan, when when I was setting this up. What's your take on the um? On the dark, on the dark matter um, storyline that was nixed. You mean the one that was intimated in two, where dark matter was suddenly being, uh, where, where we saw a sudden collapse in the universe because dark matter was suddenly being used up at a weird rate, and that was why that one star was going unstable. Mm -hmm. Um, that was what Carpishin wanted the Reapers to be fighting about all along. That was le legitimately, it was every time a race makes biotics and starts using the mass effect, it eventually comes to a point where they start uh, exciting or using or some, something causing instability within dark matter and dark energy that, is, that causes stellar bodies to go unstable. And that's the reason they exist. And that, that was a way more interesting idea to me than... You can't then then literally Asimov. Literally Asimov. That is all the conflict is. Fucking Asimov. You know, between the two of them, first off I have to say, the way you descri the way you described it, Shades, it's the anti spiral. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's the fucking anti spiral. Son of a <laughs> No, uh -huh. no, no, uh -huh. shame on you for even trying to compare the two. <laughs> hey, Fuck no, it, you. It, 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 while, while it isn't the same type of thing where the anti-spiral is trying to prevent, prevent, prevent spiral nemesis, it's the same, it's the same conflict. Your, your mere existence is eventually going to cause everything to blow up and die. We have to stop you to stop everything from blowing up and dying. So yes. In this, it, 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 when it comes to Drew Carpishin's ending of of anti spiral harbinger, I'm all for it. Uh <laughs> Whereas, and I, I and, should I should Dave every single one of you motherfuckers. <laughs> <laughs> but you can't because you know I'm right. <laughs> but legitimately, the the ending we got it's fucking iRobot. It's Isaac fucking Asimov. It's the three laws of robotics. The reason the ending sucked. We've seen it before, and it was done better by someone else. I, at, at first, I thought you were going to bring up when you brought up Asimov. At first, I thought you were going to you were going to bring up Foundation, which um, <laughs> which would not have which would ex, which would explain why the ending ended up sucking because the end the ending of the the ending of Foundation, Asimov wrote himself into a corner and had to and had to write um pre had to write prequels until his death. Yeah, but I mean, it, it, it's iRobot because the one robot that isn't under the three laws is a, is a nicer robot. Those are the Geth. All the other robots are the fucking Reavers. But whenever I always, I always hate, I always hate this whole this whole oh you, oh this this con this conclusion this conclusion is inevitable because we've seen it so we've seen it all we've seen it all these many times. I hate the I hate that particular approach. Specifically, because of the fact that it that all the all those supposed all those supposed um appro inevitable approaches that they've seen in the past, we don't get any of that. 
So we have no reason we have no reason to believe someone who's ostensibly the villain who would have just who would have just as much incentive to bo- lie to bullshit us. the story to benefit his own agenda. Oh, and remember what was established very early on in the in the first game, the citadel is always left behind. The mass relays are always left behind. The ability to discover element zero is always left behind. This doesn't strike me as, we've seen it all happen before, so we have to come back and stop you. It strikes me as, we built a zoo in which you will you will evolve along the lines we want you to, so we can come back and hunt you. This is African sport shooting, 1800s version, bitch! Which, if they wanted to do the whole... It seemed like it's... Especially since up until that point, the it was treated as it was treated as harvesting. In fact, we saw that literally when it came to the collectors, the, the collectors, and the bullshit of trying to create a human reaper with what was what was essentially techno magic. What really pissed me off about the human reaper is we were told that the reapers are made from the remains of the civilizations that they broke down and absorbed, but. We've also seen every Reaper ship being shaped like a cuttlefish. So, which we found out in the fucking stupid Leviathan DLC that the that the Leviathans are also giant cuttlefish. Um, <laughs> but the why would only one Dreadnought suddenly be shaped like a human at this point? What? This is one. This is one of those. This is why um, I've talked. I've talked about this in the past, but it's very important to have a series bible, especially when you're dealing with a expansive universe. And make no doubt, they were intending on making an expansive universe. I distinctly remember a interview with Casey Hudson, where they talked about wanting to make a universe that that they could use to tell any story that they wanted, and the and specifically pointed out that you could tell a. a a endless variety of stories within just the Citadel, which is why they made the Citadel so big. I mean, you could tell a variety of stories in the Citadel. So why didn't you? Why the fuck didn't you do what you said you were gonna do? I Fucking do... amateur hour. Um, I do think that I do think a lot of I do think a lot of it has to do with one time because they were under. They're under a lot. There was a lot of all hands on deck shit going on. Like we're t- we're talking night. We're talking ninety hours a week. And, tasty, tasty crunch bars. And the the other thing is that I'm. I get the feeling that either they didn't have that series bible, or Drew Carpishin never disclosed that series bible to everybody else. Um, I find it. More likely that it was ignored. Ignored out, ignored out of arrogance, or ignored out of stupidity. Yes. Yeah, I can go with that. And actually, th- think about it this way: it, it, if we think about the turning point where things were getting ignored more and more with Mass Effect Two. It was when Drew Karpishin was starting to take a backseat to Mac Walters. And then Karpishin is nowhere near involved with three. And it's all Mac Walters. It's a single right single head writer. And Walters are I do remember I do I don't want to bring up math I don't want to bring up Andromeda here, but I remember in an interview just before Andromeda was released, he 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 was asked which uh which in which um which ending is canon and he he laughed and said i'm never answer i'm never answering that smart on one hand smart first smart uh, thing he did on the on the other hand it's um it's ju- it's i'd say it's just as damning as if it, as if you were to say which one was actually canon better better to Take the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune for refusing to answer, then answering poorly and getting worse slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. It, yes, it sounds like 
the difference between choosing whether you have diarrhea or constipation, but uh, one of those is preferable to the other to some people. I su I suppose. Um, when it now when it comes to when it comes to the when it comes to the when it comes to the aftermath, especially with the whole the ex the extended the extended cut, um, there are there are cer there are certain things. It's certainly an improvement, but there are certain things that I did that I didn't like, namely the, namely the whole interrupting the final push kind of thing. Um, but. What I but what I do th what what I do think a lot of people, especially people now, especially people nowadays, have kind of forgotten yeah. is the sheer intensity of the reaction to that ending. Whether it be, whether it be people making videos, whether it be people making whether it be people making petitions, whether it be whether it was that one guy shooting at the catalyst for literally an hour on his video. <laughs> um, I remember that. Well, that was. It, it, yeah, it was it was the talk of the town, and for good reason. It goes back to the argument I was making earlier about no more choice mattered, but the final one. You know, it, it Mass Effect had marketed itself. Whether or not it actually com uh, it committed to that marketing, it marketed itself as a game where, as we've stated here, your choices were supposed to matter. Everything you did was going to determine how it ended. But then you get to this point, all of a sudden. Oh yeah, every, every every choice you made irrelevant. Just pick your color, and there's your ending. Doesn't matter. And you're cool. It's all the was, same ending. Yeah, it's the exact same ending. It's not and not even just pick. You know, you know, it's not even a matter of picking your ending. It's literally pick the color of your ending. Mm -hmm. It's exactly the same. And it went against everything that they had been told was going to happen. So it, to a lot of these hard, to even the most hardcore of hardcore Mass Effect fans. This felt like a blatant slap in the face. So of course there was going to be massive outrage. <laughs> I do think I do think the funniest response was the uh, was the campaign to send them to send them 200 cookies, not not cookies, cupcakes with three different colors that all tasted the same. <laughs> <laughs> Which um let's be honest, that sounds like something I would do. <laughs> yeah. Even though I had oh. nothing to do with it. I think the funniest response is when uh, the um, the FCC started getting involved to see whether a false uh, advertisement suit needed to be brought against Bioware and EA, because in official advertisements for Mass Effect 3, they promised what? 16 completely unique endings. There aren't even 16 ending variants. There's twelve at most, depending on how high your war your war assets were on specific endings you picked. Mm -hmm. And 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 they're all the same fucking ending. Yep. So, sixteen completely unique endings. They actually, I, if I remember correctly, they nearly got sanctioned. Yeah, and the, and then the, and then we'd see a sim we'd see a similar kind of false advertising s suit go go down when it comes to aliens, colonial marines, which is <laughs> the reason, which is the reason why for the last decade or so, anytime you see it, anytime you see a trailer or see or see some alpha footage, it it has that disclaimer of work in work in progress, not final. Um, and when it when it comes to the when it comes to the whole war assets thing. I can I can see the I can see the attempt to try and ha to try and present this idea that this is, that this is a galaxy spanning war, um, which br which br which brings me to the um co op brings me to the co op thing and yes the microtransactions were bullshit and there and there were many there were many um farming videos that ca that were all that were all over the YouTube um, around that time, but. What I found very interesting with the with the with the setup of the stuff you could get from unlocks in in it is that they're essentially a new they're essentially a different kind of win button. A get as Racevic pointed out a get out of jail free card. So in in other words in other words you're pay, you're paying to suck less. But I do, th but I do think, t 
I do think tying so much of so much of it to the, to those was a massive mistake. Simply simply because a lot of a lot of people who are playing a RPG are going to be interested in continuing the journey of Commander Shepard. They could give less of a shit about in, about any sort of co-op. Well, and the real funny thing about that was for the people who wanted the destroy ending cuz for some stupid reason they thought that that was the good ending. Um they you you literally could not get the amount of war assets necessary to get the best variant of destroy um without playing multiplayer. You had to play multiplayer at that point to get it. Yeah, and that that's that's a, that was like I said that was a mistake, but it, it but I when it comes to when it comes to both of these the your choices matter and the binary morality thing, um, I'd say I'd say when it, I want to talk a bit about how, about what the things that led to these particular narratives downfalls. Now, the controversy with Mass Effect Three was cert was certainly one aspect, but I would I would say much like a lot of things. The shift away from this sort of thing was a combination of t of that, as well as the rise of pop the rise in popularity of games like The Witcher. Even the first entry in the series, which admittedly what had its fair amount of Slav jank, what <laughs> I distinctly remember it advertising: there are there is no good or evil, just choices and consequences. And that's the that's the approach that The Witcher has main has maintained throughout. Much like in much like in a lot of dark fantasy works, there are no true good guys or bad guys. Just people in a really really shit situation trying to make do with what they have. One of my favorite, uh, I'm I'm going to butcher this quote, so I'm going to just say it's a paraphrasing of um of The Witcher is one time Geralt's going into a into a bar. And one of the regulars is like, I hear witches carry two swords, one for monsters and one for men. And Geralt's response is like, no, they're both for monsters. Implying that what he was killing was not men when he killed humans. <laughs> and it's, I remember, um, and actually, cha actually, championship analysis did a ver did a very good video on the whole what is a what is a monster thing. Mm-hmm. Um. And I'd and I'd say I'd say the big re I'd say the big reason why that whole binary morality thing s started to fade out is one, um, pragmatism, because ha having to having to account for multiple choices. Means that the right means that the writers and the programmers have to effectively do two or even three times the work. An excellent case in point when it comes to this kind of thing, and we'll we'll probably we'll be getting to this in a month, is the sheer amount of dialogue choices that had to be accounted for in in um something like Wing Commander, and more importantly, something like Alpha Protocol. Where you had a set of choices and then all of the reactions to the choices, which was more like a tumbleweed than a wet than a web. And the cho the I'd say I'd say the other I'd say the other thing that was that was certainly a factor is the is the fact that after after the whole thing happened with Mass Effect Three, the idea of, people were far less willing to trust. The the your choices matter narrative because the curtain had already been drawn. We are we already saw we already saw what Oz really looked like. Mm -hmm. We saw the man behind the curtain. And the uh, the other thing the other fa the other factor is I think I think. I think people were people were more interested in in carrying on a specific a specific story, and I th I think the I think the other thing that really hurt this whole choices matter narrative, Dragon Age Two. 
which I have a feeling we'll be talking about one of these days in one form or another. Um, I do highly recommend the three-part series that Ch that um, Chuck Sonnenberg did on it, which started off as Hawk, wa Hawk wants to get fabulously rich by stabbing people. <laughs> But, uh, but event eventually, especially after the first act, the it really has the whole "you're just along for the ride" because you got fuck all else to do. And when it com when it comes to when it comes to the whole the whole um binary choice thing, there were two w there are two ways that it en that it ended up um coming about. The first is you had pe you had people um, effectively do effectively do the good do the good bad power set divorced from narrative, or you or you had you had people um, do, you had people do a do a good do good bad endings just at the, just at the end. But the whole the whole whole choice whole um. Or at the very least, have choices show up only at specific junction points, and e and even then, I only saw that the most in something like Quantum Break, and they and they kind they kind of they kind of um did they kind of didn't stick the landing in different ways that maybe I'll get to if we do a whole episode on Remedy. But I'd I I would ultimately say it's it's for the best because with a with we definitely saw this in 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 Mass Effect 3 where there were cer where there were certain choices that were that were being presented as the at, solely to have a renegade option um i think one one of my favorites is in is in regard to the um to the story arc on Tachanka where you have you have the option of of helping of 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 helping to get of helping to cure the genophage or you or or you can or you can side with you can side with the with the salarians to to sabotage the efforts and they'll give you more ships let's see, let's see a bunch of uh, a bunch of a bunch of ba a bunch of a bunch of ba badass tough badass tough guys who you who you'd want to have in a fight or more ships not really much of a choice, is it? <laughs> yeah, it's the whole, that's where a lot of these things and and some later games even decided to punish you for making choices like that. And I think it's time to bring up an old staple of mine because <laughs> there is one game I can think of where it had a it had a thing where your choices mattered, just in a very different way. Uh, hello, Undertale. How you doing? I knew you were gonna bring up Undertale. I fucking I knew told it. You it's a staple. Of, I, it's a staple of mine. You know, it's, I told you know, you. it is you know, a staple of his. But to his credit, he has not brought up Undertale during Geek Watch. Well, you know, it's you know, it's really funny. You know, it's really funny here, Shades. Mm. If uh, if you hadn't brought it up, I would have. <laughs> Too sweet, me brother. <laughs> Cause yeah, Undertale was a game that you know your choices absolutely mattered you know because the entire game changed based on whether you went pacifist or genocide you could also mention neutral but really you had to go neutral even just to, you technically had to do neutral just to get to pacifist but if you went pacifist you had this amazing story with all these great characters with such personalities but if you went genocide you just went on a fucking killing spree and had to grind your ass off and fight some of the toughest bosses of all time for honestly a really bad ending. <laughs> like you had to you you the, the 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 it was a game where completionism was discouraged. Whereas Dimension. all these other choice games we were talking about almost encouraged replayability and completionism. Yep. Undertale was the antithesis of all that. And not to mention the fact that as you grinded and killed everything, um, any of the towns you got to would be completely abandoned because the monsters were evacuating. But in the places where you would see random NPC monsters on the normal map, 
like in core or uh outside snowden where you'd see things like you know the the uh oh, what's his name the one who tries to do puns but he's bad at it <laughs> um re- regardless you they you, they'd no longer stand in those positions you couldn't find them because you had killed them <laughs> yeah they were dead they're so, dead yeah, Jim. things you did in that game mattered <laughs> Well, unless before the end of a genocide run, you decided, I don't like this. Going to reset the game now. <laughs> but even then, it punished you for that. <laughs> it didn't punish you. It reminded you. you of how much of an asshole you were. Yes, it didn't punish you. It was just Flowey saying, we're not so different, you and I. Because Flowey did the same thing before you showed up. <laughs> mm-hmm. And let's... And when it comes and when it comes to when it comes to some when it comes to something like Undertale, um, I do I um, as much as I as much as I enjoy the as much as I enjoy the game, um, and I still I still need to I still need to get off my lazy ass and 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 finish Deltarune, um, which I mean, I, Deltarune I, Chapter One, <laughs> yeah, you mean which, the game? Oh, oh, the game Toby Fox may uh may never finish. Yeah, which you know we we talked about the Bioshock uh, Bioshock Infinite comparison. Mm-hmm. Undertale and Deltarune is the exact same thing. Like literally, it is it, it, it is the exact same thing. Undertale was all about your choices absolutely mattered. Deltarune is totally your choices don't mean jack shit. And is, well, is it a case where Deltarune want wants to wants to tell a specific story to expand to expand on lore or some shit? No, Deltarune yeah, is completely it, unrelated to Undertale, according to Toby Fox. Yeah. yeah, and it's clear that it is because the characters are con- very different from how they were in Undertale. Even the characters that are in both games, they are completely different from both games. Like, Except for Sans, Alfie's... who still says he did your mom. <laughs> yes. But like Alf- Alfie's and Undyne, we don't even think they know each other <laughs> in, this, in Deltarune. Mm-hmm. But Get, but getting back to the, getting back to the whole the whole um, curse of choice. The other thing, I, the other thing, I kind I kind of want to I kind of want to bring up is a lot of a lot of times when sh- when when choice when these sort of choice narratives are are brought up, um, they're they're usually brought up in, with characters who are not intended to be um, player inhabited blank slates. Um. A lot, more often, more often than not, you're more often than not you're supposed you are somebody. Um, I'm not gonna. I this might not be the best example, but I'll use the Wolf Among Us. In that, you're playing as Bigby, the big the big bad wolf. Since this since Wolf Among Us is an, is an adaptation of the comic book fables, which is actually a really damn good comic. Um, but you but your but the choices that you have. Are a reflection of what Big B could say in a given situation. Yeah, it's all things that he that, that Big B as himself might say. Yeah, it's not anything outside of that. But trying to do that with a silent protagonist, even one with an established background, the way the way um Shepard is, and I know I know people will say she- that Shepard isn't the silent protagonist. Practically speaking, Shepard is. Well, as as I said, though, it's, he's not the blank slate. Shep- Shepard, Shepard, as a character, is not a blank slate like Revenant and your Jade Empire protagonist were. Um, because of the background that you had to give him and the goal that you had to set for him. Yeah. I, it, it, I'd, it's def- that's definitely the case. I would say that it's, sti- it's still the, a vessel for the player to inhabit the same way, the, the same way, um, ma- the same way Master Chief is. Um, I can I can, I can see what you're saying there, but unlike Shepard, Master Chief doesn't have to make any choices. Mm-hmm. Master but, Master Chief, in fact, uh, has a goal, and your goal is to go for that goal. Yeah. the The point that I'm trying to get at is with with something like Shepard, they tr- they tried to ha- they tried to um, have a hybrid between between these two things, and. I get and um, between 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 a 
a blank between a blank slate and a and a character with it with an actual backstory. That seems that seems to be the that seems to be the intent, and unfortunately, that's a balancing act, and eventually one side's going to give way to the other. It's just a matter of time. And the side that gave way is not the blank slate. Which, if that's if that's the case, fine. But you've got to go all in on the on whichever on whichever side ends up um, ends up winning that particular fight. And they didn't. They continued to hem and haw. Yeah, I mean, they tr even when they tr even when they tried to 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 expand more on his expand more on Shepard's character with the with stuff like the dream sequences and the pr and the pressure getting to him in Mass Effect Three. They still kind. Of, they still kind of half-assed it because the whole thing with the recurring kid. I know some. I know some people argue that it was supposed to be a metaphor for all the people Shepard couldn't save, but it it's hard to it's hard to really have any impact when there's barely interaction any interaction with the kid. Not to mention that then the kid kid's model was used for the catalyst, and all of a sudden that fueled indoctrination theory even further. Mm-hmm. But the, and as far as far as the, and as far as somebody's, once as far as somebody slowly losing the, losing their mind because of the pressures of the situation, um, Spec Ops called. They want they want their money back. <laughs> no, Spec Ops called. They want royalties. Mm -hmm. Because because well that that's a very literal case of of somebody slowly losing their shit since. Well, for one, for one, the story the story that is taking place in, and two, the you have you have a goal that's ultimately revealed to be a lie. Mm hmm. Because you're insane. Mm hmm. And at at the very least, the th at the very least, the theory that you, the theory that you died at the beginning in something like Spec Ops has some weight. Until the ending, where there are endings that you aren't dead in yeah yeah although although one although one could argue that's even worse because of because of what he said at the end when asked how did you survive it who said i did but yeah i'd but when it comes when i'd say the i'd say the other the other um the other thing that killed the idea of bi the idea of binary morality is a greater is a greater push towards gr towards gray towards either gray storytelling or people embracing a good versus evil archetype. I mean, consider consider how consider how d consider how something like Doom has blown the fuck up, and that has no desire to tell a morally gray story. It doesn't. It has little desire to tell much of a story. Period. A bigger story now than ever. Doom 2016 and Doom Eternal have a, have an actual story. Yeah, they have they have an actual story, but it's but it's a but it's a it's a but it's a story that the art snobs would consider simplistic, and everybody else with actual taste considers considers awesome because of, because of the fact that it's not trying to do more than it should. The new DLC, by the way, mm -hmm. so good. Oh, I know. I've gone through it, and I've also gone and be, and shortly after that DLC, I found out about. Um, some people making randomizer mods. Yeah. And I tried I tried one of them and I got my ass kicked. It's a and randomizer. The, well, what what would you expect when the first encounter you you see it you see at the very start is a fucking tyrant? You could take him. <laughs> but <laughs> when yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm expected to take a, I'm expected to take on a tyrant with nothing but a shotgun. Yeah. I have your, I have faith in you, monk. <sighs> but, re but regar regardless, I, I know that, I know that, the, I know that there's a lot of people who go, who go with this whole notion that we, that um, we need to move away from simplistic stories, high, high extra credits, and also fuck you. <laughs> this is much like the same argument of complex is better and or simple is better with tabletop or any other medium. In fact, simple th and 
and complex doesn't matter. I believe it's I made if that, it's well. I believe, I believe I made that distinct point clear on in my little post on tw on Twitter the other day. Simple and complex doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. So long as you execute what you're doing well, that's what matters. Yeah. Know what you have and know what you're working with and make it work. Doesn't uh, matter how simple or complex it is, just make it fucking work. More often than not, I've, I've seen I've seen morality systems venture less into the idea of morality and more of faction allegiance, which I'm perf I'm perfectly fine with. A example of this kind of thing, even though even though it's got its flaws, I still enjoy it. Would be Greedfall. You know, how I said earlier uh, backstage before we went live that I have atrocious timing. Yes. As soon as I come back, I hear morality systems and then extra credits, and I know exactly what the fuck you're talking about. <laughs> well, you were you weren't there for the thing. You weren't there for the thing that re that really made me bust out laughing when I forced myself to sit through that vi that video about evil races that they did. Entire movie, that entire that entire YouTube video is a joke. I watched the whole thing, and my rebuttal is. Well, in the mind of the orc, the orc isn't evil because they're serving the Dark Lord Sauron, so... Argument over. <laughs> Different book. Well, it, it could be this... You could apply it to almost anything. Um, well, the, the, thing that, the thing that I found especially funny was... that was, And I've mentioned this in the past. They, they, try, they tried to insinuate that the Imperium of Man in Warhammer 40,000 are the good guys in Warhammer 40k. <laughs> well, I mean, again, subjectively, maybe. No, no, there's, there's no such thing as good guys in Warhammer 40k. That's the point. Mm -hmm. There's no one good people above all others. They're all shitty. They're all shitty in their own ways, and they're all stupid in their own ways. And it's the reason that that, it, that that story can never resolve in a satisfying way unless you literally deus ex machina the emperor out of his fucking porta potty. I still make the argument that Tyranids are the closest thing you'll get to good guys. You cannot change my mind. Bug lover. Hey, at least there's, there's, no, uh, there's no purpose behind just eat, produce, reproduce, eat, etc., etc., just, they're just trying to free you from a uh, from a grim, dark future. Brother, get the flamer. The heavy <laughs> flamer. But I have flamen verfa. It verfs flamen. But okay, I, I have, hold on. Before we go any further, as I'm as we're talking about this, I I'm scrolling through Twitter, and I have to share this because it's actually a pro it's actually with what we're talking about. Oh boy! Oh no! <clears throat> oh no! <laughs> oh no! <laughs> it makes Why? too much fucking sense. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> that that's actually awesome. <laughs> I don't care what anyone says. That's great. Is, is that no? no. <laughs> yes, he's an ultramarine. Yes, he's an ultramarine terminator. <laughs> <laughs> An ultramarine, an ultramarine Terminator, and is is that the face of One for All down there? Or is that or is that the head of a Tyranid? No, that's that's definitely One for All. No, all all for one. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. No. Oh. Which makes it even better. Fear <laughs> Citizens brother. of the Imperium, have no fear. I am well, here. I am here. <laughs> dear, dear God, it's. You know, you know, the set, the set. I'm not dis I'm not angry that I'm not angry at seeing that. I'm a I'm angry that th that th that this was inevitable because of a certain um, fan artist that that I follow who has been who has been doing, um, who has been doing various various anim various anime characters meets fort meets forty k for the last year. You know, it works including too well. putting Mid including putting Midoriya in salamander armor. <laughs> but Midoriya doesn't have coal black skin and glowing red eyes yet. If anything, Quiet. I'd probably go to Tokuyami. <laughs> no, you give it to to Dobby. 
Dobby would be a salamander. Um. Well, you can, we can't. Dick. Well, we can't make. We can't make him. We can't make him a dark angel. I think the reason he went with salamander is because green. Green, and also because they're friendly. Yeah. Um. But but back on the back on the matter at hand, I'd I'd say that the the emphasis more on more on allegiance towards factions rather rather than trying to do some sort of good evil dichotomy, I think I think works better. Because there's a lot more angles you can do, since with factions you can have it where they're not ostensibly good or ostensibly bad. It's also got a great amount of mechanical hooks. In greed, using Greedfall again as the example, uh, changing faction loyalties depending on who you're with gets you different boons. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, you also have the myriad of factions in in all of the um, Souls games, which. Signif which can significant which having a covenant with one of them can significantly, significantly change your play style. Yeah. Um, even the <laughs> and and um all, and also ch also change the possibility of who's going to gank you if you're if you've got multiplayer open. Which there there's all and the the whole faction thing it's. It's something. It's something that's almost been cliche. It's almost been cliche of a sort in um, MMOs. But I don't know why it took this long for narrative-based RPGs to em to embrace that kind of thing. Um, and I'd and I'd especially say that the that the whole the whole good that the whole good evil morality thing. Really, I'd say I'd say the I'd say the last major major franchise that tried to Im that tried to embrace it for bet for better and for worse was Fable. Ex you mean the fa the fame infamy thing? Yeah, and the thing the thing with and Fable is not exactly the best example to use with this sort of thing because of the fact that Fable does not take itself seriously at all. Not to mention Peter Molyneux always pro over promises and under delivers. Look, I, I don't need I don't need to make Peter Molyneux into my punching bag because Guru Larry does that enough for me. He's pretty much got a patent for that thing, mm -hmm. for that idea. Let's just I, I just I just got to say if you're if you're talking about a game that where one of the first quests is the kid ate magic mushrooms. Go, go, go! Find a way to cure him. Yeah, I, I don't think it, I don't think you could say that's serious in any way, shape, or form. No. Just remember that Peter Molyneux also reneged on on a deal of giving it, giving a a, a single player, um, godlike control over a game and a bunch of royalties. I'm still kind of bitter about that. I'm not gonna lie, even though God, I love goddess, the franchise. goddess. G O D U S goddess. Oh yeah, oh yeah, that th that thing that never saw the light of day and probably never will. Where where they everybody had to tap the cube and whoever got to the center first won a bunch of money and the ability to control all the rules of goddess for like a year. Yeah. Considering the nature of the internet, it's probably good that never came to fruition. Um, I have one, the guy have who won one. seemed pretty level-headed and was excited to do it. I have I have one word in response to the to that whole thing, Ard Wolf. <clears throat> <laughs> Which I think I think so I think some of you might this is, bringing up that might might be the might be the most boomer ass thing I've d I've done today. You 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 made my eyelid twitch, monk. Good job. What you don't? Remember I need a Ard beer. You don't remember Ard Wolf? <laughs> I think no, the I, is that I he do. Does I it. do, and that's why it's happening. <laughs> <laughs> Look, turnabout is fair that. play. Equal rights and lefts, asshole. <laughs> <laughs> but when, but I'd I'd say that I'd say that because of the fact that you can have a whole lot of a whole lot of narrative and mecha and mechanical hooks, that it pre it pretty much killed off that ho that whole approach to morality. The close. I'd say the close. I'd say the closest thing that we had to bringing it to bringing it back, even though they even though they didn't take the plunge with it, 
is Ghost of Tsushima. Is I had when I when I played through the game and when I discussed it with you, Zan, I had mentioned that there were plenty of times where I felt where I felt that they that they want they wanted to ha they wanted to have a mo a motif of you're either you're either embracing the honorable path or you're embracing the path of the ghost, but they ne but they never went through with it. Yeah, from what I understand. And this is hearsay, so you know, take it with a grain of salt. From from the rumors that are allegedly from reputable sources, um, they wanted to try and do something like that, but they realized it just wouldn't fit. Like it just would not fit what the story the story they were trying to tell. And so instead of hackneying something like that in and making it worse, they just did away with it entirely. You do st you do still kind of have DNA of it because you you have cases where characters will chastise you for t for using dishonorable tactics even if you didn't. Yes, but that's that's the nature of the beast. It's for something that big. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's 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 a, a while it's much more minor than the controversy of the. Uh, of the creepy guy in Genshin Impact who likes the lolly running the uh, the flower store when in the closed Chinese beta she was actually a full-grown adult woman and they just forgot to change his lines because Genshin Impact is a gigantic game with a bunch of lines of dialogue and one throwaway line of dialogue is something they overlooked! Um, yes, it's, it's the same vein, though. Huge game, changes were made, and, you know, some things get lost on the wayside. And... I'd say I'd say the old, the other case in point with it is the ending. Now, I know I um <laughs> I would I would say I would say spoiler warning, but the but the game's been out for about the game's been out for about a for about a year and we and we've already we've already we've already done several spoilers in the in the in, since we started Geek Watch. So, why stop now? And that's in regard to the to the final choice you have at the end. Well, oh, the 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 final choice at the end, I don't think actually was part of the DNA of that. I think that was something they always planned on. Do you feel more attached to uh, to the Jito and fulfill his wish because you understand Jean? And you understand how much he feels that familial connection and thus would want to grant his last wishes. Or do you ironically realize that the, the island still needs the Jito and you, uh, you let him live, not only to say, I'm not enslaved to honor, but also because Jin realizes, yeah, having no leader on the island is a bad idea. <laughs> it's it's really that one isn't even a moral choice. It's a choice of of emotion versus logic. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not gonna lie, I chose emotion. I killed that motherfucker, and I cried. <laughs> I get the feeling that ki that killing the Jito was the canon one because it's a very um I think as you had said it's a very Kurosawa way to end it. It is. It is. Remember the whole thing is inspired by Kurosawa. Mm -hmm. So the choice to kill the Jito ve feels very Kurosawa. Yeah. Feels very Toshiro Mifune. I'm sorry, but uh killing the Jito just it fits and uh and I cried almost as hard as I cried when I lost my horse, Nobu. But Nobu, I, I do want I do want to shift a bit to to the cho to the choice um th thing with in the case of in the case of um Fallout. Now, I didn't I didn't put when we were talking about the whole binary morality thing. I didn't put Fallout in it because they already had because. The karma system had was a carryover from the pre from the previous two games, from the from the pre Bethesda era. Even even Van Buren had it. 
Um, but the but the approach as far as as far as how it was implemented as time went on was a, was a bit of the issue. Now, I'm going to put I'm going to put I'm going to build a little bit of a bubble, and I'm going to put New Vegas in that bubble, and I'm going to put that bubble right over here. So everything that I say from here on, when it comes to when it comes to Bethesda, when it comes to post to Fallout, does not affect New Vegas because it's in its bubble. With three, you ha you very much had a case where the ch where um the choices that the choices that you make only s unless I'm mistaken only seem to matter at the end when Ron Perlman is narrating how you fucked everything up. I mean the choices the choices that you made only changed his ending narration a bit. Uh yeah, I can I can say that's true. And when it comes to when it comes to Fallout 4, even with even with the amount of freedom that that you ostensibly have and the much vaunted base building, um I feel like I feel like fall with Fallout 4 they tr they tried they tried to implement a shepherd like character in a setting where it really doesn't belong. Because I just keep talking about this Fallout Four. Never it never got past New Vegas. Wishful thinking, guys. We've got we've got to we've got to rip the band aid off. Just grip it and rip it. I see those aren't Fallout games. That's the point. Those are games. That want to be Fallout and have Fallout coats of paint, but they are not Fallout games. I don't know what you're talking about. I loved Fallout Minecraft. <laughs> <laughs> the point is, the could, I could design Fallout in Minecraft better than Fallout Four. Okay? <laughs> the, vo the vault, the vault dweller in Four, has a has a clear defined backstory regard regarding regarding family. While at the same time trying to do this whole thing of re of reestab reestablishing a town and de and dealing with a s and dealing with a certain <laughs> a certain asshole going another settlement needs your help. It's like <laughs> you're the fucking minute man. Why do I need to do everything? I loved my family in that game so much that I spent the entirety of it building a gigantic uh, twenty seven story tall or no twenty seven wide by a ten tall section of open faced tower. And every single archway had a full suit of power armor in it. But why though? <laughs> because why not? <laughs> it looks cool. <laughs> no reason. Um, why do I why do I get the feeling that if that if Doku was a, a space marine, he'd be an imperial fist? Because I would be. <laughs> and Rogal Dorn. <laughs> Rogal Dorn was the best Primarch. I don't care what anyone says. Also, it is funny when you actually do have a uh, when you do put power cores into the armor, and all the villagers freak out when you get attacked by death claws. It just turns to a gigantic shit show. It's amazing. But the point is, what, the point is when it comes when it comes to when it comes to that, there's there's a bunch of you. Ha yeah, you have a bunch of factions, and you think that it would utilize the whole faction based thing that, that I've talked about here. But all of those factions really don't mean anything. They mean about as much as the gangs in a Grand Theft Auto game. This, or, or rather, the the gangs in Grand Theft Auto Three, because everything onto that was more was more about the story they that Rockstar wanted to tell rather than the sandbox. Because the thing about a game like Fallout is yours is you're being you're being given the largest amount of fr of freedom and leeway possible. Like you are in something like New Vegas, your background is you're the you're a courier. Who got who got screwed over when it came to when it came to delivering the plat the platinum chip? That's all you have. That's all you have at the start. But eh, but after that, and after you after you get shot by the worst dressed man in Vegas, <laughs> the game was rigged from the start. You you and you end up t you end up go you end up having free reign to go anywhere and where and wherever you so choose. Hell, you hell, you can't, you can't, you can't. Even after, and especially after you learn the whole purpose of the platinum chip, you may not want to deliver the to the chip after all. You may want to say screw it and just and just take and just take the whole thing for yourself. 
especially especially since if you take that route, you may have you may have the uh, you may have the opportunity to be allied with the greatest yes man in gaming history, because well, he's literally a yes man. <laughs> <laughs> and the, and that's the expectation when it comes to when it comes to something like Fallout, and because because of, because of that, um, karma. Is not is not a def, is not a defining factor. Although it can be a factor, it's mainly a factor in terms of what um, what perks you can get you can get access to, and what people want to want to work with you or try and kill you, or vice versa. Although although I although I don't think I'll be saying anything controversial when I say the NCR are a bunch of dicks. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, Caesar, Kaiser's Legion may be assholes, but at least they're upfront about their assholishness. They're not trying. They're not trying to. They're not trying to hide it. But again, we again we go back to this whole faction thing. And if if any of you have seen the rants I've done over the years when it comes to alignment in tabletop games, you'll know that I prefer faction systems over over that sort of alignment based morality approach. Largely because going, bringing in a morality system is going to inevitably ask questions that the game designer isn't prepared to answer, and they, and truth be told, they shouldn't answer. Because the reason what the reason why the binary morality thing had its problems from the get go and is the fact that they that they were tying things to explicitly good or be, or bad when Ideally, it sh that shouldn't be the case, and be and because of that, the the approach that they that they ultimately that they ultimately did was go was going to have some of the dumb problems that we saw, like <laughs> like like sacrifice sacrificing an alliance fleet is somehow a good option. Over overall, I don't think anybody's going to miss the b the binary morality or the choices mattering um, motifs when it when it comes to game design in the future. And now, even spiritual successors to some to stuff like Mass Effect don't even do it. They have a specific story yeah. that they're telling. Yeah, you notice somebody's really been clamoring for it lately. Um. Now, grant, now, granted, in some cases, the reason why they don't do it is simply is simply cost benefit. Because, like I said, do, taking mul taking multiple routes means the, means you're going to have to do more work than you normally would in a li in a linear in a more linear story. But I'd I'd say I'd say the other reason is for a, a lot of I remember I remember in the seventh generation there was this attitude. That li that linear gameplay was something to be frowned at. I'd especially hear this when people would smugly dismiss console style RPGs, or for the plebeians out there, JRPGs, because I wasn't I was caught in the middle of some of those dumbass debates about JRPG versus WRPG. Um. And the ar and the the argument that was made was that was. Was one 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 had more freedom when you actually you actually look at how you actually look at the way things go and that and the games that want that amount of freedom. One, the freedom ends up being an illusion, or two, it ends up opening other problems. Glass and lineage two grind. <laughs> I was I wasn't even going to bring up that. I was going to bring up the fucking cliff racers. Oh, oh God. I mean, between that and the burning, what was it, the burning swamp or whatever, like around level 100, like, mm -hmm. yeah, freedom. Freedom to grind this one area for the next month just to hit level 105. Yeah, freedom. And the, when it comes to the, when it comes, and I don't think, I don't think anybody's going to, I don't think anybody's going to clamor, clamor for it back, even it, even when the, even when the, um, the, re the, Renaissance that we had of um, in the last few years of old school CRPGs to try and to try and bring to try and bring back some of that 
it wasn't really doing the the moral choice thing. And with with some games that sh that showed up, um, you really couldn't like consider tyranny. You could not do a binary morality system in tyranny. It wouldn't fucking work. I'm trying to think of a way you could, and I'm... Yeah, no, I can't think of so, a good way. Something to keep in mind with with tyranny is... The Overlord has already conquered most of the world. The bad ending has already come and passed. You're playing as the, as the, overlo as the Overlord's Arbiter. In in a area that has already been conquered, and because because of that, and because of the fact that it's going for a more Bronze Age style aesthetic, you really can't do the whole battle versus good and evil kind of thing. Um. Also, I've, there's one there's one comment in in the cringe the cringe worthy behind um behind the scenes co documentary that I remember s seeing regarding Mass Effect Three. Where they talked about how they had considered putting in a big final boss at the end, at the end, but decided that would be too video gamey. Their words, not mine, and I just balk every uh. time I hear that. I, uh, I don't even know what to say to that. I just, I'm just gonna drink. That, <laughs> that's my response. You were gonna do that anyway. Yeah, but now you give me a reason to. Aside from being here, Irish. I'll join you on that. <laughs> point is, point is, with the with with the with that particular with that particular approach, the I, I don't I don't know if it, I don't know if doing a doing a big boss fight against 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 the against the against the, um, ca against the catalyst or or what have you would be better. But at the at the very at the very least, it'd be it'd be something more engaging. I mean, I'm pretty sh I'm pretty sure some people do a genocide run just to test their skills against Sans. Just saying. Yeah, you think? <laughs> That's for some people. They consider that a rite of passage. Well, uh, I remember. I remember. There's. Some people, some people at one point cons considered um, considered beating Kaizo World a rite of passage. So, same principle. Pretty much. Um, same thing goes with same thing goes with um, Plutonia. Especially Plutonia on ultra violence, which if you end up going through that, um, I warned you. <laughs> you know that reminds me, I still never beat Ozma in FF9. I fucking hate Ozma. I hate yeah. him because he cheats. I know. <laughs> I even maxed out. I would. Oh, holy! Why am I gonna die to? Wait, what? <laughs> How does that work? Yeah. Yeah, maxing maxing out doesn't doesn't help you against Ozma. He ch he cheats hard. He cheats the same way the AI in in, a, in an RTS cheats. Yeah. Oh God! Total War Warhammer. Talk about fucking cheating. I did the math one day. I got so pissed off. I actually sat down and did the math to figure out how the fuck do the dwarves have freaking cannons this early in the game? Cheating. That's how. But as f I'd say, I'd say that when it comes to when it comes to when it comes to future entries with RPGs, you're not you're you're not going you're not going to see that. Um, that bu that binary morality set up in the same way that we did in the seventh generation. Um, Lord, I'd s and I'd say the big reason is that is that certain people want want to do want to do the want have still got it in their fucking heads that they need that they need to be um ho that they need to be doing Hollywood style stories, which um is the re is the reason why that it's. Is the reason why those that particular mindset is ultimately going to collapse in on itself in a matter of years? Because what they're ultimately yeah, we doing, replace one bad idea with another. What they're ultimately doing is the same th is the same thing that almost killed the film industry up up until the up until the seventies, when the when the film breath started to, started to come in and take over, of of um trying trying to do these extremely big bloated bloated projects. With um, 
as a, as a, as a means to compensate for television. And in this in this case, trying to trying to do these big bloated projects to compensate for the ri for the rise of more in for more independent, more sandboxy approaches, thinking that people want people want to do the play it for the story kind of thing. When right now, the two the two games that are that are blowing up, that I that I see blowing up the most are Valheim and Among Us. Well, and the thing is, if, just touching on your point, when it comes to uh, Hollywood or narrative-driven uh, games, one of the worst mistakes you can make is trying to inject moral choice into it. Like, no, don't do that. It is it is a way to piss people off very fucking quickly. I'm looking at The Last of Us Part Two. It If you're going to inject moral ambiguity into the story, you have to do it in such a way that the player has to recognize that despite your choices, the outcome of the story is going to be predetermined. There is not going to be a good ending or bad ending. Like you are, you're telling a story. Don't try to give the player the illusion of choice. That's going to piss people off. Our, what would what would you say would be a good would be a good game example of moral ambiguity? Since you since you've brought up a bad one. A good example of moral ambiguity. I'm trying to think of a game that did it right of recent memory. I'm not going to bring up The Witcher because I already did that. Yeah, that's actually the one that comes to mind first. So I was trying to avoid that one myself. It. I'm not going to bring up Knights of the Old Republic either. Um, I don't think there has been a good example of moral ambiguity in a game that's narrative driven. At least not one that's come out in the past five years or so. It again, with the exception of the aforementioned Witcher. It to some degree you could bring up certain snippets of franchises, like as much as I hate to say this, Game of Thrones does touch on moral ambiguity in a relatively good way, even though the, the narrative is what uh, makes it. But they do, they do touch on it. I... I can't think of one, to be perfectly honest. I really can't. Um, near Automata. That's... I mean, maybe, maybe Yakuza? Maybe? Maybe you could make an argument for that? I'm not going to be the person to attempt to do so, but I could see someone else who's more familiar with the game trying to do it. I already said. And even that's a stretch. Near Automata. Even even with even. See, with I never, that, never got the chance to play Near Automata. Even with that, that's st that's still slim pickings, Zan. Yeah, but I'm I'm giving one example. I was only asked for one example: malicious compliance. Of course, oh, <laughs> yes. of course, you would go that route. <laughs> <laughs> you have only yourself to blame. I mean, other things that do moral ambiguity um, poorly, it'd be a much easier list to name. You're very correct yeah, about how moral ambiguity isn't common in a in a good way. Is um, duly noted. Because it's hard to do so in a narrative game. As, it's actually better to have black and white morals, and yeah, I'm taking a shot at extra credits inadvertently by saying this, it's better to actually have more black and white morals in a narrative-driven game than it is to try to tackle the subject of moral ambiguity. I mean, Undertale is a perfect example of that, since we already brought up Sands. Like, there is a good and bad. Like... And it actually blends a lot more to the narrative and a lot more to the gameplay and storyline than trying to be morally ambiguous by it. Maybe, maybe you could also make an argument for uh, Prey, the new version. Because I... of how the endings of that game work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess. I, I could see you making the argument. I'm not sure how how solid it is, but I could see an argument there. I think 
the problem with the problem with trying to pursue some sort of mor some sort of moral grayness is a lot of is a lot of the people who tr a lot of the writers who try and pursue it are pursuing it in a method of bad faith. Like they're do they're doing it to show how artsy they are. Um, and that's the reason I hated bringing up Game of Thrones is because even though technically I know George is going for the whole uh, good guys or bad guys playing for the other team, but you can clearly see like what actions are good and what actions are bad. Even then, it still devolves into a morally good or morally evil uh, mindset. It's not. Well, yeah. And the the I think the real problem with pulling moral ambiguity and enforcing those types of morally ambiguous choices in these games is a lot of people who want to force moral ambiguity aren't only doing it in bad faith to be artsy. A lot of these people are doing so because they're moral relativists. Yeah, that's a good point. But well, why did you why did you join the Waffen? Uh that did it to save my family. Yeah. Uh, I mean, but still the 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 argument for moral relativity is one I will never understand because that's a dumb argument that a lot, that makes you lay down and get your your throat slit by your by uh, your invading forces because you have to understand their morals from their side. No, the fuck I don't. <laughs> so, it, getting a good example of morally ambiguous choices and morally ambiguous stories is hard because you have to make it to where, honestly, your choices can't matter for the ambiguity to remain. The other, the other major, the other major problem is the fact that you're dealing with a game, and no matter what, when you're dealing with a game, you want you, you have to in some way reward the player for the choices that they make during the during the process of that game. Yeah. So, which which is why the faction system of Greedfall yet again um, is the closest thing to choices of moral ambiguity that have tangible rewards. And again, in bringing up the uh, in terms of video games and trying to make moral choices, it's like, okay, here's your choice: um, murder this person in front of their daughter in order to save your family, or don't, and then get shot in the head by your commanding officer, and game over. That's not fun gameplay. And if you That's choose the uh, if you choose the decision that allows you to continue playing, you just end up with a lot of feels bad man memes. Yeah, that's the shoot the dog moment all over again. Mm -hmm. uh, God, that was so. Fr you have to. You have. They didn't even give you a choice in that one. They made you do it. But the the yes, you because it is a game. You have to gamify choices, at least in some fashion, to some small extent. Yeah, which is which is why I said using Greedfall yet again as the as the as the example, um, because those choices. Faction faction dealings are morally ambiguous by na by their very nature. Each faction is out is out for its own self interests. And yes, in some games, some factions are. I mean, you just look at them and go, "You guys suck," and I don't ever want to support you. Hi, NCR. Um, <clears throat> but uh, in other games, you know, all of the factions. Their goals are laudable to some extent, and it's just up to your personal choice at that point. I actually really liked Greedfall for doing that. Mm -hmm. Like I said, Greed. I I think a lot of people looked at Greedfall as the as the as the spiritual successor to old Bioware. It's not. It's, it's its own it, thing. It's very much its own thing, and there's and there's plenty of parts within it that are unpolished. But I am of I'm of the opinion that I would rather have a a game with interesting ideas but lacking polish versus a game that ha that is very polished but does not have interesting ideas. Yes. You want to be intrigued and you want to be kept kept engaged. Mm -hmm. Even if there are rough edges so long as the engagement is good. You know, overall the experience is good. Yeah. I mean for I've um I've I've freak I've frequently pr I've frequently praised um um Rainblood Chronicles which yep. is 
De definitely has its jank, especially when it comes to its translation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I won't fight you on that one. Um, and as well as well as how, as well as its storytelling, but for its gameplay experience of being essentially a two D Devil May Cry, it accomplishes that with flying colors. And actually, is actually even f even for people who are veterans with DMC, um, Rainblood still gives them trouble. Well, I mean that's probably more due to the nature of of the change between two D and three D. But regardless, um, um, to circle this all back around to mm -hmm. choice, yeah, and to tie it in with with the point you just made about uh, interesting ideas. But ultimately, the reason the curse of choice was a thing, and we'd see it being phased out, is it wasn't interesting enough. It didn't engage the player enough. And especially in the case of later Mass Effect games and other games of that time period that all copied the, the template, the gameplay wasn't enough to make up for that lost engagement. Especially when more often, more often than not, the when I look when I look at it objectively, the weakest the one of the gameplay part the especially the combat part of the tr of the Trinity has always been the weakest part. The strongest part with Mass Effect has always been its universe. Yes. Um, conversations have have had their have had their ups and downs. Um, exploration, well. We already know all the jokes that we could make about about the nomad, <laughs> or the Mako. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> the Mako, which um, look, which looks like an which looks like an awesome vehicle, but mo but moves around like a moves around like a drunk in a bouncy castle. You know what's funny about that? I got damn good at using the Mako. So moving around <laughs> like a drunk in a bouncy castle. Apparently, I'm king at it. <laughs> anyway, guys, I'm gonna head out. I'm dozing off over here. All right, stay see you later, frosty, shades. Man. Later, shades. Hi, right, guys. But uh, and then mm -hmm. you had the hammerhead, which is your hover Mako. I love how they named their tanks after sharks. That was nice. Although the problem that the problem that I had the problem that I had with the ha with the hammerhead for for one, um, you're in you're in very confined environments when you use it. And two, there's not a whole lot of consequence. In fact, you're kind of overpowered. Missiles! All oh, the missiles! More mi more missiles than Troa. Uh, no, no, we don't have full burst. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, but less we do missiles have than Macross. That's for sure. <laughs> we do have enough missiles to make a mega make a Megas XLR joke. <sighs> missiles, more making... missiles, all the missiles. Now you're making me sad. Megas XLR, come back. But uh, yeah, I, I think I think the ultimate conclusion behind all this is if the choices presented are not interesting enough, are not engaging enough, and you haven't tried to make up for it anywhere else, you're just going to disappoint everyone. Now it could be asked why we didn't why we didn't talk about Andromeda during this whole thing. There is a couple of reasons why. Largely, there's not a whole there's not a whole lot that I have to say regarding Andromeda. The, that ha that hasn't been already said. To the whole um, the whole t the whole tone selection um, it ultimately co ultimately covers what we talked about in the past about your choice being ultimately meaningless, and. Three. The only thing, the only thing I really, I'm, I'm really interested in talking about with with Andromeda is how is how it is how it tried to do a classless system without having the equipment to justify it. It tried to do a Kingdoms of Amalur or a Dragon's Dogma and failed. But that's a, but that's a story for another time. And ultimately. The, so, a series like Mass Effect, the str the strongest thing about it will be its universe. This is why it does it has not surprised me that in the intervening years, I have seen several attempts to in, to integrate it with tabletop gaming. And in fact, if Bioware had any smarts, they would they would make one of these official. Mm. 
There w- Bioware there, smarts. There have, That's an there, have been, there have been there have been Mass Effect RPG adaptations for three editions of D and D, for Fate, and for Anima, and those are just as well as well as some system agnostic ones, and those are just the ones I was able to find. I am sure that there's a lot more. Oh yeah, and I, for, I forgot that there was one for Savage Worlds as well. And the reason I point these things out is, well, for one, it's my thing, but also to demonstrate that the world had that much of an effect that they wanted to explore it in ways outside of the confines of the video games. They created an engaging and interesting sandbox. And the part of the reason why part of the reason why I wonder why that why that wasn't why it wasn't taken advantage of is because they did take advantage of this when it came to dra- when it came to Dragon Age. They con- they got in contact with Green Ronin to do a Dragon Age RPG. It's because Mass Effect is sci-fi, and for some reason, too many people associate TTRPG with high fantasy, like. Most people don't really like legitimately when it comes to the the, the layperson. Most people do not consider science fiction or uh, science fantasy as things that you would see in a TTRPG, despite the existence of of such games as Shadowrun, Cyberpunk, Red. Oh, I I could go on for days when it com- when it comes to it, and we could and we may as well mention the elephant in the fucking room, Traveler. <laughs> I'm still waiting for that review. Yelling at me <laughs> isn't going to make it come out sooner. I'm not yelling. I'm just saying. The only one here yelling is you. I'm just ribbing you because it's funny to watch you squirm. But with that, with that said, I think that I think that would I think that's a strong enough coda as it as it is when it comes to um Ma- when it comes to Mass Effect. And the and the whole choice, the whole life and death of the choice narrative, as we've discussed, even though we went off the rails many a times. Um, but next next week, I think we need to tackle something a little less serious, a little less super serial. So <laughs> keep it. So keep an eye for keep an eye for that because that's that's coming. And I get the feeling there's get, there's going to be some lulls to be had when it does. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers, present and not present. My name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, and join the watch.